Hi, I'm Douglas Wilson, and this is an introduction to The Sin of Empathy, which is episode one of season one of Man Rampant. Joe Rigney and I discussed the distinction between sympathy and empathy, a distinction that has recently caused some internet discussion, like the internet needed some discussion. This episode is presented to you free of charge, and if you go to the Canon app, you can watch the entire first season of Man Rampant free of charge. Also, stay tuned to the end of this uh, video. You will get some exciting information about season three of Man Rampant. So please go check it out. Welcome to Man Rampant. Out there in the talking heads business, opening monologues are given very important sounding names like the memo or talking points or shrieking feminist nonsense. Because we here at Man Rampant are very important talking head professionals, this opening monologue will henceforth be known as the marshmallow shtick. It's gonna be sharp, but also flexible and bendy with flaming goop on the end. Nobody should be hurt too badly, should be friendly. So then, welcome to the marshmallow shtick on guard. I wanna talk about tribal empathies. We live in empathetic times and no, this is not a good thing. We also live in a time of increasing fragmentation and polarization resulting in virulent forms of tribalism. Back in the day when we were faced with old school tribalism, the tribe was an objective reality outside yourself and it set one's baseline. This was when tribes had names like Apache or McGregor. As a result, members of a tribe tended to grow up with a fixed loyalty to that tribe when considered against all others and empathy was out, out of the question for others. It was doled out accordingly. What was good for the tribe defined everything and you empathized with a fellow member of the tribe simply because less to no empathy was accorded outsiders. In other words, tribal membership determined the empathies. In our fragmented times, we are seeing the opposite, like a river reversing course. Instead of tribes created by geography, ancestry, and language establishing our empathies, our empathies today are now establishing our tribes. Shared sentiments now harden groups into tribes, complete with tribal loyalties. I was once walking through a major city and passed the Center for the Empowerment of Deaf Alcoholics. That's an example of hyper-specialized empathy, which will result in the long run in a fairly small and exclusive tribe, sort of like the White House press corps, often drunk, never listening. But there are alternatives to tribalism. Whether we are talking about massive tribes of white liberals or micro tribes of city league bowlers in Topeka, on the secular side of things, those alternatives would include massive nationalist ideologies like Nazism or internationalist ideologies, communism, which is the kind of thing that happens when tribalism tries to scale. And mass ideologies like petty tribalism demand loyalty and empathy and to hell with outsiders. The only real alternative to an insider-outside tribal mentality is the Christian faith. Because the claims of Christ are ultimate, and because He is the head of the church, these claims originate from outside the cosmos, which means that His claims trump every other claim. I have a tighter bond to someone who is baptized in the triune name, but who lives in Tehran, than I do with my next door neighbor who is not baptized. The Christian faith is genuinely international. Regardless of how much superficial commonality I might share, the universal point of integration, the Arche, is Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. He is the one who became incarnate. He was born of a particular woman named Mary. He had a hometown, Nazareth. He went to Nazareth High. He spoke a particular language. He was of the tribe of Judah. The blood of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba flowed in his veins. He had 10 toes, and I've been baptized into him. This means that I do not have to repudiate my particularities, and you do not have to repudiate yours. In order for loyalty to exist between us, I can belong to my tribe, and I can do so with gratitude and affection. But I cannot bow down to my tribe, in my case, Clan Gunn from Scotland, because Christ was not from that tribe. He was from his tribe, I can be from mine. And because he ascended into heaven and left all tribes behind, I can keep an appropriate emotional distance from my tribe. Something more sports fans and identity politicians need to learn. What does this do to my empathies? That is what we are here to discuss today.
So I'd like to welcome Joe Rigney uh, to Man Rampant. Uh, Joe is the professor of theology and literature at uh, Bethlehem and is pastor at Cities Church in Minneapolis. And he's a friend of the minister here in Moscow, has been here a number of times, and we thought we'd snag him for this uh, inaugural episode of Man Rampant. And I, w and, and I want to uh, see if what I can do to get you in trouble. <laughs> that's why I came. Okay, that's, so what, what better way to get into trouble than to question the uh, uh, validity or value of empathy? Right. right. Empathy is, it's, it appears in our day, uh, a universally good, time, good thing, good time thing. Uh -huh. Who could be against it? Right. Everybody empathizes with everybody. Right. And who could possibly be against it except for perhaps Joe Rigney? Yeah, well, uh, probably others, but definitely, definitely me. Uh, I think probably you want to begin by distinguishing a couple of things so that people don't get confused, um, because that would be bad. Um, so you're uh, saying Christians shouldn't be loving? Sh yeah, that, that's that was something <laughs> like that. So we want to distinguish empathy from sympathy. And the funny thing about the way those words get used nowadays is that I think people think. Um, if you were to say, which one's better to have? Like, which one should Christians have? Should, should you be empathetic or should you be sympathetic? I think a lot of Christians would say empathy is better. It's the higher, the more loving, the more kind Higher, thing. deeper, wider, better. That's right. It's yeah. just better in every way. It's like, it's like, but it's sympathy, but it's even better. It's like okay. the improved version. Well, the reality is, is that the Bible commands us to be uh, uh, sympathetic, because the sin, it's compassion, right? So right. sympathy and compassion are, are the same. Um, it's the same word. So they, they um, one's Latin, one's Greek, and it means to suffer with. And okay. the empathy is this more modern term. It was like invented um, in like the 20th century. It's not like this ancient word or this old, older thing. Um, it's invented in the 20th century, and it means to suffer in. So that's kind of the key like linguistic deal. And I think most people then would say, well, if you, if you have the choice between just suffering with someone or suffering in them, like really that there's a sense of we really get into somebody, we really enter into their pain and their They're grief. drowning, you go in headlong into you, the you river go, with you them. Go, exactly. You, right. you dive in there and, and you're all in. And we think this is better. This is a, a better virtue. This is more virtuous than mere sympathy because sympathy kind of feels like pity. And, and nobody likes to feel pitied. We don't want people to feel bad. Sympathy feels like you've got your foot on the shore reaching a hand out. That's exactly right. Acting better than they are. That's right. And, and I think that, and that actually is the most relevant difference between them. Because, um, so empathy is the sort of thing that you've got someone drowning or they're in quicksand and they're sinking. And what empathy wants to do is jump into the quicksand with them, both feet. And, and it feels like that's going to be more loving because they're going to feel like, I'm glad that you're here with me in the quicksand. The problem is you're both now sinking. Right. Right. Whereas if you do, um, I'm going to keep one foot on the shore and I'm actually going to grab onto this big branch and then I'll step one foot in there with you and try to pull you out. Right. Um, that's sympathy. And that's, that's actually helpful. But to the person who's in there, it can feel like you're judging me. So sympathy is clearly hierarchical. Right. right. It, it implies it implies that one person is the hurting and one person is the helper. Right. And, and, no, and, and that's part of the problem is no one wants to feel like they're the hurting. We want to equalize everything. And so, and so empathy demands, get in here with me, otherwise you don't love me. What, but what do you lose when you get in there with them and you're all in? They're drowning, they're in the quicksand, they're in the trouble, and you identify with them completely. Right. Um, what are you losing contact with? What's the shore that you're losing your purchase yeah. on? So you lose the ability to actually make an independent judgment about anything that they're saying or doing. In other words, you, you lose contact with truth. The ability, okay. the ability to actually assess. So, um, so if you take a scenario where someone is actually hurting, so let's, they're, they're actually in pain, they're actually grieving, um, and, and they've been wronged or something like that, and then now there's this expectation either from them or from other people, show some empathy here, you know, get, get in there with them. Um, if you say, well, hold on a minute, I just walked up here, I want to actually think about this situation, I want to maintain some emotional distance in order to be able to evaluate 
you know, who did what and when. Is, is this true? Is, is this, this true? Um, what's true here? Is the perception accurate that this person, if you want to maintain that dif, dif, uh, distance, that's inevitably um, alienating to them. That feels, there feels you like- You clearly you're not, hate victims. Right, you hate victims. You're, you're not actually loving me because I only feel loved if you endorse everything I say, or if you validate everything I say. And if you question, so, so if someone comes in with a tragic story right. and you're a pastor, I'm a pastor, right. a, a terrible story comes uh, uh -huh. into your study and someone pours out, yep. you know, um, my brother started molesting me yeah. 10 years ago. Right. Awful things. And yeah. awful things. And awful things that actually really do happen to people, yep. right? So the first thing you know is that this story absolutely could be true. Right, straight down right. the line. It could, it could actually it could be, be true. as bad as all of this. That's right. right. It could also be false. Right. Right? She yep. could be trying to get even or trying right. to do something. or yep. it could, There could be any number of That's right. things that could motivate someone to mm -hmm. lie about a story like that. Yep. How can you, how can you listen sympathetically right. to someone like that, while reserving to yourself the possibility of coming to a later conclusion that this was a story? Right. So um, I, there, there is an initial move where, in a, in a situation like that, I think you want you want to lean in in such a way that there's a, a giving of the benefit of the doubt to the person who's sitting in front of you and has been. Um, has been wronged or is claiming to have been wronged. There's, so you, you, there's a judgment of charity that you're giving, mm -hmm. um, but you're also reserving the right to ask some more questions, to mm -hmm. investigate a little further, to, to probe a little bit. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, um, in, the, in the modern world, it doesn't even have to be as, you know, the grave evils. It simply, it could be a small s slight. Um, so if you think about it, in, uh, this happens a lot, say, in marriage counseling, right? So you get uh, husbands and wives who are, who are missing each other, um, or, or, a, or a husband or a wife um, who's having problems with other people outside the marriage. Okay, so a conflict right. with a friend. And they start describing the situation. This is what was happening. This is what they did. They gave me the stink eye. They, she, she did this. She said that. Um, but she looked at me this way. Um, and if you start to say, but did she really? Like if you just ask the clarifying question, are you sure? Or, or was there maybe more to it than misunderstanding. that? Was it maybe a misunderstanding? Maybe it wasn't malicious. Um, empathy is going to say, you can't do that because you just need to, you need to hear them out. You need to listen. You need to identify. You need to join them. Whereas sympathy says, if they actually were being rotten to you, if they were being cruel or, or whatever, um, I want to, I want to be with you in that. I want to join you in that, in that suffering, but I want to make sure that it was actually suffering and not a misunderstanding. So empathy, uh, if I could run ahead of you, yeah. empathy is the means, the conduit by which relativism is pouring into counseling. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way to put it. So it, because, um, because the question of what really happened is um, made secondary to the emotional f state of the person in question. Right? So that becomes the end all be all of everything. And any, any challenge to that is a threat. Um, and, and you can't, you, you're, not allowed to, you're not allowed to do that, which is why, um, so w one of the ways to, to say it is, um, God commands us to be compassionate. He commands us to show sympathy, but people demand empathy and they, and they regard it as a kind of betrayal if you refuse to join them in their pain, in their grievance. A very personal betrayal. A very personal betrayal because you just, and, and you just don't get it or you're, or you're not showing love to me. I'm the, I'm the victim here. Why aren't you joining me in this? And it's, and it's a visceral thing. It's not a, um, I don't think you need, we need to think of people who are in that as um, deliberately malicious. It's often um, instinctive, reactive, visceral, and it's, it's, it's how out their, of control. It's how their emotions have been trained. Right. They've been, yeah, they've been trained. They're, they're, they're running into to ruts, which is precisely why um, what's needed is somebody to have their hand on the branch and only one foot in so that you can try to help pull them out so that their emotional responses um, get channeled in better, more healthy more healthy directions and not get stuck. This, this might be an oblique um, or tangential uh, support to this, but tell me what you think of this. Okay. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I started objecting to Christian counseling, biblical counseling being run on business line as a business, okay. where uh, the client comes in 
makes an appointment with a trained professional who's also a Christian and who incorporates Christian uh, principles, but right. can bill your insurance company and and okay. or take a check or whatever. Yep. And the difficulty is that we are that I saw is that we already had a system like that in the law. So in our legal system, okay. we've got it all worked out where uh, both sides, both disputants have an attorney whose job it is to represent your case the right. best they can. To be your advocate. To be your advocate. Right. And, and it's ethical for an attorney to do that even if he thinks you're a skunk or you're, you know, right. even if he thinks that uh, he can, he can do that because the system ensures that the other guy has the same advantage. Yep. Right. So, right. Everybody's right. got one. You, right. And if you, and if you can't afford one, one will be appointed for Correct. you. Correct. So the, uh, a person comes into the attorney's office and the attorney is paid to be on that person's side. Right. Okay? Right. Yep. He's paid to be on his side. He's uh, a partisan. He's a partisan. So imagine our legal system where just the def defendants got an attorney right. or just the prosecution got an attorney. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, well, we walked into that in the, in the world of counseling because I go in, I pay my money right. to this trained counselor, right. and I think that he's supposed to be on my side. He's supposed, right. he, he's supposed to believe me. And the person I just accused of rape or the person I just accused of molestation there's nobody on his. There's yeah, nobody on his side. Not in that room. Yeah. Not in not in that setup. Right. And of course, if the story is true, mm -hmm. then we don't. We're not going to shed any tears for the guy who's actually guilty. Yeah. Of of that, but at a fundamental level, we don't. We do not yet know who is the victim. Right. Right. Yeah, that's right. And I think um, so. In principle, it might be possible for a really sturdy counselor to operate in a, in a system like that where someone's coming in and paying them for their for help. But it would have to be the sort of thing where from the outset they're, they're saying, okay, um, you're coming in here and asking for help, which means in order to help you, to actually help you, I have to reserve a certain kind of emotional distance from you and I need to be able to, to evaluate and, and assess the whole thing. And so if you're looking just for someone to be on your team, this isn't going to work, and, right. there, and that would have to be kind of set up from the from the get go, so that when so that you don't pull that out halfway in, and they say, "Hey, wait, you're changing the rules of the game." Right. You you can't ever commit to being automatically on their side on on their side in in the dispute, and in pastoral counseling, I I try to say there are three sides involved here. There's like in marriage counseling you were describing. There's the husband's perspective and there's the wife's, wife's perspective and then there's Christ's right. perspective. Yes. And rarely do I see Christ's perspective map onto right. yeah. the, the husband's or well, the wife's. In total. Right. Precisely. Straight across. Straight, straight across. And a minister is supposed to be there as the representative of Christ. Someone That's right. who's steeped in his word, who's, who understands biblical mm -hmm. law, biblical principles, and who will bring them to bear on this situation. But he's there, not with the wife as a client or the husband as a client, right. but That's right. Christ as Lord. Right, and when, and when you have, um, so in a, in a healthy church setting, I think if you have people who are in principle committed to that, you can make a lot of progress. Because um, even, even if there's a subtle demand for empathy, in a setting like that, you can always draw them back to first principles where you're saying, well, now hold on, um, I'm not here to pick sides. I wanna, I wanna help, right? right? And, and picking sides actually might be more harmful. Um, but if that's, if that's been undefined or if that's not clear at all, then you get the, the um, there's escalation when the misunderstandings happen because all of a sudden I thought you were on my side and then all of a sudden you started asking me questions or probing in certain ways that I, I wasn't comfortable with. Um, and, you, and you reserve that emotional distance and the accusation is going to be something like you're not showing empathy, you're not being empathetic. Or let, let's um, zoom in a little further. Let's say we're not, it's not a... Uh terrible situation like a molestation or it's not right. even uh, marriage uh, marriage misunderstanding such that counsel is required right. suppose it's just a little tiff between husband and wife uh -huh. where uh, the wife has had a skirmish with the next door neighbor lady over the dog or something right and and she's telling her husband uh, uh, the the story mm -hmm. and thought bubble above his head is um, 
Uh-huh. I'm not sure. Right. I'm, I'm not sure you handle that perfectly. Um, he's got some doubts. Uh, she might have a grievance against him. Right. Because, of course, a husband should be sympathetic. Right. Because Christ looked at the people, he was compassionate, he had compassion on them. Right. Sympathy, total sympathy. But he can't just say automatically. Right. Everybody in my family is right. Right. That, yeah, and, and so there's a, there is a genuine kind of uh, allegiance. There's a, you know, if in a situation like that, the husband is, should have an allegiance to his wife more than, say, the neighbor. Right. So that's the, that's right. the more fundamental bond. But what that actually means in practice is he's responsible for her and how she processes and works through the situation. She, he's not responsible in the same way for what the neighbor does. So say the neighbor was, was a jerk. Um, it's still the case that his main concern should be how to help his wife sort through her response to it and, and, get, and make, make it through, which may mean enduring whatever junk the, the guy threw at, threw at her. But um, if what she's wanting in the moment is simply um, agree with my... Um, total perspective. Total perspective, right? Just be on my side. Um, it's going to cause problems down the road if he just acquiesces because you're setting up a pattern where, um, you know, if, if, uh, if, you, if, if whatever she says goes and the, and the demand is for empathy, what you're asking for is a kind of fusion of, of personalities where everything, is, uh, everything is, is, becomes one in a, to- in a total. You lose yourself in the other person and there's no longer a you and a me. There's only this blob. All right, so it, it goes without saying, and you, you touched on it before, it goes without saying that a husband should have more allegiance to his wife than the neighbor lady. Yeah. He, yep. More allegiance to his wife's perspective than hers. Right. But he also should have a deeper allegiance to the truth yep. than to any family member. That's right. Okay. Yes. Now, how can you say that a husband should care more about the truth than his wife without sounding like a mean person? Um, without, without sounding like a logic machine or a theology chopper. That's right. Well, um, as, you have to remember that truth is a person. So Jesus is the truth. So the allegiance is not to some abstract principle as opposed to a, a real person. It's, it's that there's, it's nested allegiances. I'm, I'm um, fundamental allegiances to Jesus above everything. And then within that, that entails a kind of subordinate allegiance to my wife and to my family, um, to my friends, to my neighbors, to my country. All of the other allegiances are nested under that, which is a deeply personal allegiance. Okay. Um, and so I think, the, and, and that's where, um, and, and you can actually make headway with that with, with people. If you say, I'm not just, I'm not just being a fusser. Right? I, I actually want to love God in love, in, and love you from that as opposed to being forced to turn you into God. You, you can actually throw them a rope and actually get them out. I actually help them. Right. Actually help them. And, that, and there's another distinction I've made over the years between counsel and counseling. Okay. Uh, you know, some people don't want counsel. Right. They don't, they don't want counsel at all. Right. Because counsel would give them what to, something to do from the Bible, and then they need to go do it. Yep. Uh, some people just simply want counseling. They want a therapeutic right. affirmation uh, session. Right. They want a shoulder to cry on. Uh-huh. Right. And, and, there's a pl- and there's a place for that at a kind of initial level, I think. I think that there's a way in which you enter in, um, and the first thing you need to do, you know, so Job's, Job's counselors um, did pretty well for about seven days. Right. Right. The when, seven their, day, when their mouths were shut. When their shut. mouths were shut and they were just there, what were they doing? They were suffering with him. Right. They were suffering with him. Um, and then they opened their mouths and, and got it all wrong. Um, but, but there's a place for kind of allowing the grief to come and to just be present in the pain. Um, but that, when that season eventually needs to come to an end, what happens next? And it can't simply be ratify all of the... Um, pain, grief, anger, frustration, and just say, you're right in all of that. All right, so to, to tie, off, tie off this um, point, yeah. sympathy is coming alongside. Sympathy is compassion. Sympathy is walking with someone yep. in, in their pain. Um, it's identifying with them, but it's not a total identification. Right. You never forget your allegiance to Christ right. in the identification that you, yep. you're you making with this person, That's right. whoever it is. Um, empathy is headlong, all in. Right. Whoever the victim is or whoever the, the person demanding the empathy is, uh, yeah. they um, 
they're like God. They will not share their glory with another. That's right. They, they demand everything from yep. you. So you, um, what we're called to do is we're called to grieve with others, but we cannot lose ourselves in the grief of others. That's the kind of fusion. That's the, um, I've, I've, there is no me left. So what you're doing in that situation with empathy is you're putting someone else in your emotional driver's seat. You're, that you're giving them the keys to your emotional car and saying, you can take this wherever you want, but they're the one who are actually hurting. So that's, that's the problem. And instead you have to maintain, the, I'm, in, I, I'm responsible for me. And in order to help you, I have to maintain responsibility for me before God. And then I actually might be able to be some help. All right, so that um, having to retain your own identity and your own allegiance to yep. Christ uh -huh. while you um, exhibit the compassion that a neighbor should exhibit. Uh -huh. Love your, the second greatest commandment. Yep. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. But the first commandment is love the God Lord your God him. above all things. So yep. uh, sympathy remembers to love God while loving the neighbor. Yes. Empathy abandons God for the sake of the neighbor. Right. Turns the neighbor into God. It turns the neighbor into God. Okay. Um, you mentioned something about maintaining your own identity, and that reminded me of... Um, a writer that we both appreciate, okay. Fried, Friedman. Yep, Edward Friedman. Um, well, uh, we both, I'd like to talk a little bit about Rene Girard and Friedman okay. here in this because yeah. um, sympathy and empathy, that sympathy empathy distinction is very important and, um, and a lot of people miss it. But it, at the end of the day, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Love God and your neighbor, not uh -huh. just your neighbor. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, but since we're talking about relationships, mm -hmm. uh, we have, and, and oftentimes we're talking about husband, wife, oldest son, daughter, right. next door neighbor. Webs of co relationships. Co-workers. You know, right. every, um, oftentimes, when you're talking about families, extended families, in-laws, neighbors, co-workers. Churches. There's char churches, elder session, yep. uh, elder boards. Um, uh, deacon boards, yep. uh, committee, pastoral search committees, you name it. Uh, you get these, um, you get a, a group of people in the room mm -hmm. and you start to, there, a certain crackle starts to develop. Mm -hmm. um, competition, emotional throwing of el elbows, yep. people positioning themselves, yep. playing the game, working the room, yep. etc. And you could, in many meetings, you could just set your iPhone on the table and it will charge by itself <laughs> right. by, from all the crackle, from all the yeah, crackle yeah. in the room. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Friedman and, and triangulation yeah. and uh, mimetic desire. Yeah, so, so Friedman is, uh, Edwin Friedman was a, um, he's, he's, he's passed away now, but he was a, uh, a counselor and a kind of um, psychologist who um, really focused on kind of this systems theory of, of, of approach to counseling, where he recognized that you're never counseling just an individual. There's always that web that they, they're bringing with them. They tracked it in. They tracked it in. And that if you only try to treat the individual as an individual, you might be able to help a little, but it's the, the whole system is the thing that's amping everything up. And so you need to figure out how do I get at the system? And what, and what he argued was, um, you get at the system not by trying to um, change the most immature, um, uh, un unself-controlled person in the group. Instead, you identify the people who have the most integrity, the people who are most have it put together, and you work with them. And all you're trying to do is help them to maintain control of themselves, take responsibility of themselves in the midst of all of the tangle. And what you would find is, or what he would find is, if you can do that, if, if people can maintain their identity, maintain their integrity in the midst of all of that junk, differentiate themselves, differentiate themselves not lose themselves in the big mess and not, and not be reactive. So um, the, the crackle in the room is often one person does something and then there's um, the, the counter move, which then escalates and it's just banging around the room. With nobody admitting uh, with what's nobody going on. nobody admitting what's going on because everybody knows what's going on. Um, and everybody feels wronged by what's going on, but no one can admit what's going on because then they'd have to admit that yes, they did hit back. Yes, they, yes they, that was manipulative and I manipulated right back. Um, and so instead of trying to, you know, um, let's just remove the, the bad person. Well, if you remove the bad person in a system like that, they'll just reemerge. 
somebody else will fill that role that the, that the person, you can't just cut it out. You, you have, have a job to, open. There's a job there's opening a job now. You actually have to learn to, the, the system has to change in a fundamental way. And you start that by focusing on the most, the healthiest individuals in the group and, and helping them to maintain their integrity and then to link up with others and creating a different kind of air, a different kind of nucleus, which then challenges everybody else in the room. Either you're going to get on board with the healthy way of doing this or you're not. And if you're not, you're out. And in some situations that could result in uh, the healthiest people in that office or the healthiest people in that scenario refusing to empathize anymore. That's right. They're, they're right. not going to because because in it, when, when you move beyond just the so we, a second ago, we were talking mainly about like in a marriage or in a small setting. Um, when you begin to widen out and empathy is that what empathy is going to do is it's going to tap into our reactive herd instinct where there's this desire, this togetherness idea that we, we, everybody has to be on the same page, which means we're all going to adapt to the least mature member. Right. Everybody's going to, we, we just, whatever so they say. It's a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom. Whoever throws the biggest temper tantrum, whoever is the most uh, unstable, we're just going to do everything we can to make sure they don't erupt. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're doing that, as long as you're adapting to the immaturity, you're not actually growing and challenging people to, become, to take responsibility for themselves and to, and to do what, what, what God wants them to do and what's good for the, for the whole group. And so what you, so you, but you can't, um, the, the difficulty is, is that when you come into a situation like that, it's easy to kind of want to say, this person over here is the problem, when the fundamental thing you have to do is take responsibility for yourself. It's always putting the onus back on what, what am I as an individual actually responsible for? Right. And the first thing is me. Right. how I'm responding. And so one of the things that we, you could talk about is the difference between reacting and responding. So reacting would be um, unthinking, visceral, um, you know, instinctive. Um, it's like what happens when, you know, somebody, when the doctor hits your knee and you just kick, right? right? If you're reacting, that's what's happening. As opposed to responding, which allows, again, going back to the emotional distance, allows you to kind of, they did that. Now I'm going to think about what the best response is, which might be, you know, um, something that will cause them pain. You don't want to cause them harm, but that might be painful. You're going to say something. Might be an awkward, difficult conversation. Awkward, difficult conversation. But you're responding with deliberate intentionality. You're, you're, you're leaning in um, intentionally and not simply erupting. Right. Um, and, so that, and, and so that was kind of Friedman's um, basic paradigm in coming into these big messes. Um, I'm going to find the people who are already the closest to health and I'm going to try to help get them healthier. And either they're going to pull everybody else with them or the people who, when, when, when people begin to realize my, my manipulations don't work here anymore, the pouty face that used to work isn't working here anymore. It's either going to, they're, they're being challenged to grow up and take responsibility for their own emotional responses, or they're going to take their ball and go home. If, if, if they insist on remaining a parasite, Right. They're going to have to find a new host. They're going to have to find a new host. That's right. And that's, and that's actually Friedman's um, uh, preferred you know, image of, of leadership is basically an immune system. Um, it, it, you're trying to be the immune system, which is not mainly about, it, it, it does fight bad things, but it also regulates good things. It's just, it's health, it's health in the body that then prevents contagions from settling in, <clears throat> taking over the good cells and, and spreading. And so focus on your own integrity, your own uh, differentiation, your own distinctness, your own identity as a person responsible to God for you. And if you do that, that's, that's all you can do. You can't, you can't change them. You don't have that ability. You're not God. So uh, tying this back in with our first uh, topic, the sympathy, empathy thing, uh, the person in the family who's sitting in the corner you know, pouting. E e pouting. Uh -huh. um, that is that person is proposing to destroy the family. Right. Right. That's what that's what the proposal is. Uh -huh. And if we all think if all the strong Christians think because they've been taught from the pulpit, mm -hmm. they've been taught in Christian literature, they've been told over and over again that you have to identify um, Weep with those who are weeping. Don't ask questions. Right. Just lose yourself in their mm -hmm. in their sorrow. Yeah. And they think that's the high road. It's difficult to do. Uh -huh. or, right. Yeah. Uh, so it must. So it must be biblical. Right. It's difficult. So it must be the Jesus way. Um, we find ourselves setting up shop to destroy our church. 
right. to destroy the church plant, yep. to wreck the family, yep. because that seven-year-old with the sulks yep. is going to be a 17-year-old with the sulks. That, that's exactly right. And, and uh, you know, it, you, so you mentioned the sulks. It reminded me of, of Lewis, um, C.S. Lewis. So in, when We CS, needed to get Lewis into this. We needed to get Lewis into this. You, <laughs> you always have to get Lewis into this. So um, Lewis in The Great Divorce describes the, the kind of person who did that, who goes upstairs and has the sulks because he knows that if I go upstairs, when, if I don't get my way and I just go get sulky, I know that my sisters and my parents are eventually going to come in and they're going to apologize even though I was the one who was, a, who was rotten. And they'll, because they just want to make peace. They just want everybody to be happy again. And so I've, I, and, and you train yourself to get sulky to get your way. Um, and, and that's, again, that's that demand for empathy. You, you don't love me if you don't, you see, if you don't, if you see this face and you don't mo- lean in and, and say everything's going to be okay and, and we're sorry, um, you don't really love me. Well, um, in order to actually, and, and what you're doing is you're establishing patterns in the family or in the group or whatever that will, that will quite literally destroy the thing because, because everybody's going to, and then, and then you work out from there. And this is where the cultural piece really comes in, right? Because once everybody learns that's how the game's played, then it's a fight to be the victim or, right. or to be the defender of the victim. Right. If I can, if so. The victim is <coughs> wingman. The, yeah, exactly. And so, um, uh, th- this is the cultural challenge where we are today um, in, in Friedman-esque kind of terms or, or, or whatever, where we weaponize our victims. So, um, th- and, and, and sometimes the victims aren't, they're actually, they're real victims. They've right. really been harmed and, and it's awful. But then other people come along who, who, d- who realize the way that I can actually make, make, make something of myself, the way that I can actually have some power here is by being the defender of the victim, right. which means the victim's always right and, and so I'm going to always, um, there's going to be no questioning. And if you try to actually say, well, hey, let's, can we just pause for a second, make sure we've got the facts straight. You're a hater. You, you don't love them. You're not loving them. And now you're, now you're attacked. So if the person is a false victim, if the victim is lying, mm-hmm. that's bad. They're hurting themselves. Right. If they're a true victim, then, and the whole culture around them rallies around them in this way that we're talking about, all we're doing is victimizing them again. Again, right? Because you're, you, you're using them. You're not. You're not. You're using them in a power play. You're not actually trying to help them become whole again. So, if we wanted to illustrate the how how far gone um, pop evangelical culture. Well, not just pop evangelical culture. Evangelical culture, reformed evangelical culture, is I think pretty far down the road mm-hmm. to just to. Uh, destruction on right. this this thing. Right. Uh, imagine this scenario, and maybe comment on it. Imagine a scenario where a young husband is going to be get married later the, in the week, and and it's a Christian bachelor party. It's not a pagan bachelor party. Right. It's a Christian bachelor party. Okay. And and the guys all gather around to give little bits of wisdom and right. advice. All of his married buddies are going to... All of his married buddies who have been married for three months. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They know everything now. <laughs> um, so they're all giving him their exhortations. And let's say an older Christian who's been married a number of years stands up and says, Son, I want you to promise me that you will never apologize to your wife unless you really did something wrong. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now... Uh, the young man might go, huh? Uh-huh. But everybody else is going to go. <gasps> yeah. Why, why are they going to do that? Right. Because well, uh, that. I mean, that's right. And, and um, I. <laughs> it's funny to think about the scenario because you can just you can immediately feel the cringe of, of oh no, why? And, and you and then and then you have to start diagnosing why is there the oh no? Why why would it be a bad thing to only apologize for things that you did wrong? Right. Well, because there's sometimes where there's a certain kind of pressure to apologize just to, just to smooth things over, right. just just to like it's it's simpler, um, and and it's it's simpler to just say I'm sorry, even though you in the back of your head you're going I don't actually think I did anything, but but she's unhappy, um, and 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 it works that way. Main, you know, we we we're talking mainly about um, men to women because we're mm-hmm. we're, we're men. Um, it could work the other way, but it doesn't often because, because women tend not to um, get, men tend to not do the mopey thing and get their wives to do it because most women despise that. When, right. when a man tries to run the game, run, the, run this play, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It just looks... Not nearly as well. It's not, not nearly as well. But a husband who sincerely wants to love his wife and wants to make peace may, will be willing sometimes, right, to, 
uh, just smooth things over because it's easier. So um, let's, we've gotten uh, Friedman in here, we've gotten Lewis in here, let's get Gerard into this okay. mix. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the central takeaway valuable things that I got from Gerard is how he pointed out all through scripture, the psalmist and uh, Job and different places, um, the, the, uh, the designated scapegoat mm -hmm. in, um, in an ancient society was expected to go along with the accusation. Right. Okay. Yep. And uh, Job, for example, just flat refused. Right. No. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing right. that. Um, look, the friend said, just apologize. Uh -huh. Just say you're sorry. You clearly did something wrong. Clearly, clearly did something. Just take one for the team. Uh -huh. Say you're sorry. Take responsibility. Uh -huh. Everything and, will be okay. And Job said, because his allegiance was the to truth. truth. Right. Right. His allegiances were he was anchored outside the system. He was mm -hmm. he was anchored outside of his friendships. Right. Now I I take uh, this is I don't want to go astray on this, but I believe that Job was the second king of Edom. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, there was a, the second king was named Jobab. Jobab, and, and maybe it's short. And, but but whether he was the Just, king, it was his nickname. Yeah. Job was short, for short. Job for short. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I believe that whether he was the king or not, he was one of the most powerful right. figures great in the country. The yep. Yeah, one of the great men of the East and really rich. And it means if Job is wiped out, mm -hmm. the whole stock market, I mean, okay. yep. I mean it's, a, it's a national yep. calamity. So it's not just a couple of friends coming and looking for an apology. Right. It's his cabinet. Right. Yeah. You know, some of the some of the influential the people right. okay. who said, "Look, it's we really t it's really time for us to move on and uh -huh. and try to rebuild this economy, and and we need you to say you were wrong." Right. So God will. So God will bless us. Yeah. And it's sort of like and and in the pagan world, uh, Oedipus does take one for the team. Right. You, you know, anybody who thinks that Oedipus really did kill his father and really did marry his mother. Yeah. I, I've got some beach right. beachfront. Uh, property in Kansas, I'd like to, yep. uh, you know, sell you. Um, he he take he takes it and mm -hmm. he goes into exile and he he accepts it. Job doesn't take it. Right. David David doesn't take it. The psalmist yep. doesn't take it. They right. they they ref absolutely refuse to apologize, unless of course they did something wrong. Right? Yeah. When the Nathan, Bathsheba happened. Yeah. When Nathan the prophet rebukes David, he 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 really repents mm -hmm. against thee, the only have I sinned. Right. So it's not never apologize to your wife. For yeah, It's never apologize to your wife unless God thinks you wronged her. Uh, yeah, if God thinks you wronged her. Yeah, you should be the quickest. It should, you should be, it be, it should be immediate, should be no question. absolutely there. And it should be sincere from the heart in order to put things right. But if you are apologizing to your wife simply as the way of kissing and making up, right. And what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to build my marriage on the firm foundation of lying. Of lying. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to lie to my wife. And it's cowardly, right? So, I mean, it, it, that, and that's the, that's the trick, like, like uh, psychologically or, or whatever, is it fe in the moment it has the appearance of, of love. But the reality is it's just, it's just another form of cowardice. And a man who's cowardly in that situation, that's, that's the first place where he needs to show some courage and he needs to actually love his wife, and we, which may mean let's have a conversation. Uh, you know, it, it looks like it, it, it's the sort of situation that um, this looks like work. It looks like we're going to have to go back and forth a couple of different times because I don't feel like I did anything wrong. You clearly feel like I did something wrong. And so we're going to have to keep doing this until we figure out what does God actually expect. And biblically speaking, a man who uh, a man is not going to be able to stand up for his wife. Uh -huh. Unless he's able to stand up to her, right, right, and 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 it's the sort of and and uh, she will respect him more if he does. Like if he can actually show, like there's a um, courage in a man is is attractive and admirable to a godly woman. She's going to look at that and, and say, um, there, he's a, he has a backbone. He's not a pushover, um, and so uh, the, if he acquiesces, she actually loses respect for him. Right. Over time, and it, and it sends you down, and then it, get, it gets worse. I've, I've seen other situations in the church where people want you to apologize just as a way of negotiating and compromising. Right. Right. 
Yeah. Um, it's like it's like the it's like the negotiation on the um, you know the, the plea bargain. Yeah. You know you know you, you, twenty five to that twenty five years to life. You know right. it's like well we'll let you off with only five in probation right. and and so just take the deal. Right. That's right. But you have to say okay I'll lie in order to keep in, in order, order to keep, to the, keep peace. the peace in the church in the uh, in the service of the one who is the truth. Yeah. We are going to. Yep. Build, we're going to build on a lie, right? So the empathetic, the empathetic culture, the therapeutic culture. Uh -huh. uh, years ago, I was in a um, situation where I was meeting with another counselor, and a woman had accused uh -huh. a family member of abuse, and the other siblings were saying, "What are you talking? You know, uh -huh. what are you talking about?" And I, I said something to the other counselor, like, "The problem with this whole setup is that it's not true, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. It's not true." And he said, "This is, I've heard it plenty of times since, but this is, I think, probably the first time I heard it, was he said, well, it, this is her truth. Right. Th this is true for her. So in her cocoon, in right. her vat of sentimentality, right. in her uh, cauldron of emotion, yep. she needs companions in there. Uh -huh. And since this is true for her, she needs someone in there all the way saying, right. it's true for me too. That's that, and that's where... The believe the victim, you know, believe the victim always. always. Right. And I'd say, okay, am I allowed to find out who it is first? Yeah, right. Which which one right. is the real victim? If the victim, if, if the victim that I must believe uh -huh. is the first one through the door, mm -hmm. uh, right? It does it. Yeah, you've you've got to be able to ask the questions. And um, in in the in the culture like ours that has so weaponized this, where people people have have learned this is how you make your way. Like if you actually want to be somebody, do something. If you want to get into the point of, of if you want to be untouchable, this is how you get untouchable. I think that there, as Christians, there ought to be like a, a genuine compassion for people who've been catechized in this way of operating so that we don't sit there and look at them and go, um, uh, we, we don't want to despise them, right? right. We, we want to be able to, to have compassion, which means um, resisting Right and not going mm -hmm. and not going along with it and being willing to be the job, being willing to be guy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna maintain my integrity. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, that's right. So um, let's. Um, we've been talking about marriage and church. You know, yeah. uh, marriages, families, on the ground stuff where right. you can see their fa facial expression. Uh, but this is clearly a culture wide phenomenon. This right. goes from the Atlantic to the Pacific and yeah. and probably elsewhere. Yeah. But it's certainly mm -hmm. triumphant here, which means that it has to show up in newsrooms. Mm -hmm. It has to show up in how stories are right. told. It, yep. it, it, it's got to drive this. How, how would you uh, talk about or advise someone on watching the evening news? What to watch out for? Right. What, what are some of the tells that would yeah. indicate this kind of thing is happening? So first thing would be don't watch the evening news. <laughs> no, but um, so part, part of what you would want to do is add, so, so some, something comes on, on the screen and says, this is the big bad thing that just happened. If your first instinct is simply, that's awful, and I need to, do, I need to say or do something about it. Like, I need to... I need to get on Twitter right I need right to get now. on Twitter right, right now, now, and I need to, to let everybody know. So, I, so there are, uh, um, you know, so be, being on Twitter, you can see people who that's how they operate, is that they're looking for the latest outrage, and they're ready. It's a hair trigger, just like that, right? Hashtag, I stand with. How do you spell that name? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, that's exactly right. And... Um, and so if you find yourself with a kind of knee-jerk reaction, inevitably what you're doing is you're, you're falling into the tribalism thing, right? Where, um, you know, there are certain people who I've got in the other tribe. And so, of course, you know, it's the Hatfields and McCoys. Of course, the McCoys. That's just how they are. And so I, there's an immediate instinct to just react, to just react to, to whatever the news is and to then, you know, retweet it, spread it around before anybody's had a chance to, you know, cross-examine the witnesses or whatever. And so um, the way to know you're doing it wrong is if you find yourself always doing that, and then, as happens sometimes, not always, but sometimes, um, it comes out that actually the story wasn't as it was first presented. There was, it was more complicated and messier. And now you feel like, now you're stuck because you were one of the ones cheerleading. Right. And now you're stuck. And at that point, what you ought to do is issue an apology. You ought to say, I was responsible, I was reckless, and I'm going to do better next time. If you never do that, then you're the sort of you're part of the problem. You're part right. of the reactive chain that that's feeding the whole thing, 
And so for me, when I when I when I'm watching the, my my litmus test for myself is something like there are a number of times where I think if that's true, I would really like to say something about it. But I I but before I do, I want to give it time to know if it's really true. You want the pieces to fall out of the you sky the first. And and then and then figuring out what actually is my obligation in this situation. Like if it's happening across the country, what's my first obligation? Well, my first obligation, if it's that bad, is to probably pray, not mainly to try to organize some kind of media campaign. Because the irony is, um, this is this is related to a whole a whole different cultural phenomenon. But it's the virtue signaling thing. Yeah. It's how do I demonstrate that I'm a good person by retweeting the right things or liking the right or things? Retweeting it first or being the first. Yeah, to being be, you know being on the cutting edge of 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 doing that. And and I don't actually have to do anything. Uh, meaningful, because what I feel like is meaningful is the raising awareness or the the publicizing or the joining, and uh, and I sit there and I think when I when I'm looking at that and I'm going even if even if I agree with the cause, right? Um, what's 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 my responsibility as a Christian? Fundamentally, it's not to sit there and. and social media blast is am i praying am i asking god to do something if it was really that bad god bring your judgment if right. it, you know show mercy to those who need mercy like go to him mm -hmm. to deal with it not simply erupt on the internet as though that's going to solve anything. and the virtue signaling occurs in the inflamed relations between the sexes right the the me the me too world mm -hmm. and it, it comes up in uh cop cop shootings or cops shooting Blacks, yeah. the Black Lives Matter thing. Yep. It's almost like an instant polarization. Right. So if if I let's say some let's say some respected person, not someone that rumors were floating around for years, but yep. some highly respected person was accused by someone of right. molesting them or you know yeah. some sexual Having crime, them, yeah. and they go to a, some feminist leader mm -hmm. to interview. What do you think about the charges that were dropped today? Mm -hmm. And she, if suppose, just imagine her saying something like, well, he denies the charges and uh, the investigation has just begun. I really think we need to wait and, and see what happens. See what happened. I would go. Yeah, right. You'd be shocked. I'd be shocked. And I would be so shocked that I, I would think to myself, I thought she was a feminist. Right. Because that's the tribe yep. that immediately mans the barricades. Mm -hmm. And there are men who man the barricades in the same way, sort yep. of the MGTOW. Yeah. Men, men going their own way, guys. The guys are right. Yep. The men are right. The women yep. are right. The blacks are right. The cops are right. Right. Um, well, no, we li we know we we have a doctrine of man's sinfulness and depravity. Yeah. We know that this story that I just read about a cop shooting an unarmed civilian is quite possibly true. Yeah. Right. And, this and wicked and high wickedness. Right. right. That's high right. wickedness. That's possibly true. It's also possibly true that. He was legitimately fearing for his life, and yep. the the person who was shot deserved to be shot. Yep. That's this is a fallen world. That's also possibly true. Right. Um, the the predator who preys on, you know, yep. staff and yep. secretaries and stuff. Well, that happens. That's real. Well, that's real. That's that real. really happens. Yep. So this story that we're, I'm hearing, it might really be that. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it's true that women are capable of misrepresenting what happened. That happens. Yep also right so i wonder what you know yeah so and and that's and and this is where as a pastor so i um i i watch i i keep abreast of that kind of stuff not because i mainly i really want to i don't i'm not interested necessarily in whatever kinds of things are happening across the country that's not my responsibility but i know that my people are tracking with that kind of stuff and it's shaping them and it is forming them and, and hardening them into tribes and the irony of this, this is a very gerardian kind of Kind of observation. What what happens is um, th there's a polarization where people think that the that they're the white hats and the other guys are the are the black hats. Well, they're good guys, bad guys, um, sons of light, sons of darkness. At the precise moment when those two sides are becoming mirror images of each other, right? Right. That polarization is it's a mirror, and so the and the more that one side reacts and feels like we are the good guys and they're the bad guys, and then the more the other side does the exact same thing. The whole thing is is obvious that both of you are are um, whatever differences exist between you, the similarities and how you're responding, reacting, escalating, are, is so identical that the only way that this is going to end is with somebody getting stoned. 
Like at some point, this, all of this pent up back and forth is going to go somewhere and it's going to be very, very ugly. And so as a Christian, I want to be able to identify that, but, at the, but I don't want to participate in it. And I want to make sure that my people are able to, 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 to properly distance themselves so that, the, so that if, it's going, um, if it's going to get ugly, I don't want them in there throwing stones. Right. There's a um, Buffalo Springfield back in the, back in the 60s, is, uh, uh, for what it's worth, singing songs and carrying signs, mm -hmm. mostly saying hooray for our side. Right. And both sides have the same side, uh, yeah. the same signs, Hur hooray for our side. Hooray for us. Uh, uh, Gerard talks about basically, I, I forget if this is his metaphor or not, but the, what I see happening in our culture of the antipathy that's, I mean, we hate building, each other like, yeah. uh, like I can never remember. Right. Okay. Yep. And we hate each other. We hate one another on many different fronts. Right. Uh, there's a, uh, it's a balkanization. It's, yep. uh, but it's the fragmentation kind of thing. It's right? fragmentation, but there's a unity to the whole thing mm -hmm. um, that uh, I don't know if this was his illustration, but it's my illustration of his point. And that is human cultures are built up into thunderheads. Uh -huh. Right. Um, right. Towns churches, denominations, families, any group, any significant group of people builds up into a thunderhead right. where there's an electrical charge in there yep. that's got to hit, some, it's got to... It's got to go someplace. It's got to go somewhere. Yep. And when I see that charge, and I've, I've seen it over the years, that charge, that crackle, that yep. uh, problem beginning to develop in the church or in this set of relationships, yep. I, I see it. Um, since God's solution to that was the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross, right. that's the lightning rod where yeah. the wrath of all the world right. you know, goes there. Goes there. Right. Um, if I see wrath starting to accumulate, yep. if, if I'm observing my people being shaped by, well, what, what do I think about Black Lives Matter? And yeah. bad things do happen to blacks. You know? Yeah. Driving while black, and, yeah, you know, th being things like harassed that. in a store. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, that's true. Um, that happens, and so I'm, uh, I want to empathize with them. Yep, and I'm all in, and then somebody else is empathizing with the sheriff's department. Right, you don't know what it's like to go on. You know, yes, somebody else is empathizing with our brave men in uniform. Somebody else is empathizing with right. uh, women. Uh, yeah, you, know. um, you have all these people empathizing, which aggravates the charge. Right. And it's building up and it's going to be catastrophic. Right. Unless God raises up preachers to preach the cross. Right. That's it. That's that's right. Because the only thing. Um, yeah. The only thing that can take the charge and not obliterate the whole system is is the cross, because that is it's the foundation of forgiveness. That, that like if you can't forgive as Christ is you. So you have to be forgiven and then you can forgive as Christ has forgiven you. That's the only way out of that. Right. It's, it's the renunciation of the blood guilt. It's the renunciation of the grievance. That's and the only way. It's, and it satisfies. Right. It's, it's satisfaction. It's justice. It's not just pass it over, sweep it under the rug. It didn't really happen. But, but it has to start with, with a fundamental forgiveness. It has to start with mercy and blood of Jesus. Right. Otherwise, it's not getting anywhere. And so when I look at the present moment at the kind of crackling and, 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 uh, and escalation, um, there's no telling like what who the scapegoat is eventually going to be, there's no way to predict in advance right. because it's the sort of, it's, it's, gonna, it's a hair trigger and you don't know what the what it's the like hair It's like predicting where the, what, what, where where the, the lightning, lightning is going to strike. That's right. Um, but the, the, the main thing is, can we as Christians not get caught up in it so that we're just another one of the, the crackling? You know, we're right. just another, you know, um, uh, you know, if it's like a circuit, if we're just another circuit that's channeling the energy and, and slinging it back into the system with greater force, can we actually be a place where the charge stops, like where, right. where it, it hits a wall called the gospel and, and, it, and it dissipates? And the gospel's embodiment in the church mm -hmm. instead of the church being just another, you know, you know, just another monkey in the cage. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I don't know if I'm being a little dire on this. I'm interested in your thought on it. Um, it, as I'm looking at the escalation, the ramping up, the increasing hate, hatred and yeah. malice and rage yep. that is just uh, gratuitously offered today, it seems to me that we have got either two, we've, there are two things that are going to happen. Either there's going to be a great reformation and revival, right. 
or there's going to be civil war? Yeah, so that's a, it's an interesting question about whether or not there's a, um, you know, can, can it climb back down short of the Reformation, right? right? And, uh, and one of the, you know, one of the factors that, that's... that's um, well, there could be a famine, I guess. Yeah, that's a so, famine so, might fix it. Yeah. <laughs> um, or, you know, oftentimes in situations like this, you know, what's, if, if you've got all of the internal crackling, one of the um, surest ways to, like, diffuse it is to find an external enemy, right? So a war externally helps to shore up. Now we may be so far gone from that because the, the you know right. the, the escalation is so much that we can't even rally around the flag overseas or something right. like that, and we're tired of all of that. That used to I, that used I to work. Say, that used to work. Right. Um, and then the question is whether or not um, you know all of the all of the businesses who are highly incentivized to not allow a civil war because their profit margins depend on it. Can can do anything to kind of mitigate mitigate it, but I, at this point it's 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 uh, I think it's so unpredictable. So the only thing you can do, um, in my mind, is you know there's a verse in Isaiah where where it says um, he, talking about God, He will be the stability of your times. He will be the instability of your time, or He will be the stability of your times. So when you're living in unstable times where there's this high degree of unpredictability and everybody is on edge, like you know leaning forward. Um, and everybody's ready with, you know, the pitchforks, um, and, and it's just crackling. Um, the, the only hope there for the Christian who feels that anxiety rising is to go and say, God knows. He's the stability of our times. Let's be faithful where we're planted, not, not be faithful everywhere we're not planted. Right. Let's be faithful where we're planted, in our church, in our community, loving our real neighbors, not, not getting involved and getting lost in the, in the interweb. Um, let's love our real neighbors well. And, and stop being empathetic with them. And stop empathizing <laughs> with them. That's right. Um, love them well. Preach the gospel and pray for that, that, that rain. Pray for the, for the gospel to, to fall. It seems to me that men are, uh, if I would turn to address the men about all this that we've been talking about, I would have to break it out into, I've got good news and bad news. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the good news is that you don't have to be empathetic. Uh -huh. be because they didn't want right. to anyway. Right, yeah. <laughs> but the reason that men don't want to be empathetic is they don't want to be sympathetic either. Right, they don't want right. to be compassionate. Right. right. So um, the Bible tells husbands to love their wives. It tells wives to respect their husbands. Yep. And I've believed for a long time that this is, this these uh, differentiated commands are given to us for a reason. Uh -huh. um, wives need to be loved. Husbands need to be respected. Men right. and women run on different kinds of fuel. That's right. They run diesel and regular. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and so wives need to be loved. Husbands need to be respected. But also, God commands to our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Husbands are told to love their wives because, generally speaking, husbands are not that good, right. at, good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, wives are told to respect their husbands because, generally speaking, wives are not that good right. at By it. By nature, that's not. But that's given, not. given sin, given the brokenness, the fall, Right, that's not our natural bent. That's right. And, and since we have to get C.S. Lewis in here again, okay. I can't talk to you without getting him that's in what we do. twice. Um, Lewis says that uh, men tend to define love as not giving trouble to others, mm -hmm. and women define it as taking trouble for others. Right. And the woman's definition of love is closer to the biblical model. Christ took trouble for us. Right. Right. Okay. So um, women are better at loving. Men are better at respecting. Uh -huh. And so God tells men to love, which means that they have to be all in sympathizing. Uh -huh. Right? They, uh, men yeah. have to be tender, compassionate, loving, right. sympathetic. And they should think of empathy. They should hear that word like someone said bone cancer. Or right. right. That's right. So I would say empathy is the parasitic version of sympathy. So it's a knockoff. It's, it's, it's what sympathy looks like when it goes bad. Right. And, and so there, there ought to be, for, for men, um, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's out as you're engaging um, on, on social media or, or whatever, wh whatever your context is, um, you ought to be mindful of the subtle ways that you're being manipulated by demands for empathy. Right. right. And you ought to and every time it happens, you ought to find some way to resist it. Right. Right. It can't you don't let don't be steered by the demand for empathy. Instead, actually show compassion. Right. Actually lean in with help. Don't don't get stuck 
um, twisting in the wind as you try to conform to whatever the latest and that, grievance that is. And that last thing, you, this thing you said there about actually showing compassion it, is what keeps you from veering into the other ditch. Because if people, if you, if you refuse to show empathy, mm -hmm. then it's going to be about five minutes before people are accusing you of being the king of the jerks. Right. Heartless. Right. You're heartless. You're, you're heartless. You're right. the king of the jerks. Right. And when people start pounding you for being a jerk, you're a jerk, you're a jerk, you're a jerk. At some point, some men are going to think, well, if I'm going to be H hanged, hanged for a thief, thief, I might as well, well steal something. Right. Right. That's right. <laughs> and so they veer off and they say, okay, I'll, okay, yeah, I'll, be, I'll a be a jerk. That's right. Right. Deal yep. with it. Yep. Deal with it. And that's um, uh, that. Res oftentimes, when men go that way, ag uh, again, the m the MGTOW movement, yeah. the men going their own way, yeah. it's just bitterness and resentment seething, boiling over. Right. You're going to call me. I've been I've been trying to be masculine. I've been trying to provide. I've been trying to lead. Yep. I've been trying to do all, and I've been slapped down, slapped down, slapped. And finally, right. Uh, and, never mind. And and what's interesting about both of those responses is both of them are actually very unmanly. Right. They're both driven by a kind of um, refusal to take up the mantle of responsibility first for yourself. So when I'm my, 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 my basic exhortation to guys when they're in situations like this is always you're first responsible for you and not getting sucked in. Then the second thing is you're going to try to help your wife also not get sucked in. And then from there, you're going to try to help your family not get sucked in. And from there, you're going to try to help your church and, and so forth. Right. So, but, but you can't, you cannot export what you don't have. Right. You can't help them if you yourself are part of the problem. Well, if a man doesn't manage his household well, right. how, can he, how manage, can he lead in the church manage, of God? They manage the church of God. And so the fundamental call in, in, in the present moment is not mainly for guys to figure out whether or not, you know, you know so we, we, it's, 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 it's interesting to speculate about whether we're going to end in a kind of uh, crisis, sacrificial crisis with civil war and blood. But the fundamental thing for an individual man is are you taking responsibility for yourself? And then having done so, are you taking responsibility for those who are under your immediate care? Be a man there right? and, and, then, and then trust the rest of God. So masculinity without pr permission is not chewing tobacco or getting a right. Navy, no. Navy SEALs henna tattoo. Or, uh -uh. No, no, no. no. It's, no. It's taking responsibility where you are. Where you are for what God has given to you. Well, Joe, thank you very much. Yeah, my Great. pleasure.